welcome everyone. There's more seats over here if people want to take a seat. We can just extend networking lunch uh, for the whole time if people would prefer that. So just to give everyone a sense of what the next hour looks like, uh, you'll get to hear from me. I have some opening remarks for the next 15 minutes or so. We'll then bring up Greg Nelson from Highmark Health to talk about the living health strategy. And then we have an amazing panel discussion. We have some rowdy people in the back. I'm looking at Harris and Aaron. So it's become a summit tradition uh, for Databricks to recognize leaders across all industries in categories like using data for good and democratizing data. So if you were here earlier in the week on, on Tuesday evening, we had this award ceremony. And we're really honored in healthcare and life sciences to have peers, have organizations that uh, were finalists in these categories. So I want to acknowledge, and I think some of these organizations are in the room, CareSource, Health Verity, Ontada, GSK, and Humana. Uh, so maybe we can give them a round of applause. As well as Tufts Medicine. So Tufts Medicine actually won the Data Visionary Award for its WISE platform. And uh, what WISE does is it brought together uh, more than 50 disparate EMR systems, which led to novel applications, including AI-based applications like patient schedulers. Uh, so also want to give a shout out to Tufts. And then we select one additional winner. So each industry uh, gets to select one additional winner uh, for data transformation. So this year I am thrilled to announce uh, that Humana uh, has won this award for healthcare and life sciences. So what Humana has done, um, if you've heard them, they've presented summits past. They build out their foundational machine learning workbench on Databricks. And what's really been incredible to see is that platform become more embedded in the business. So the first stage was very foundational, bring in the data, do feature engineering, start standing up models. But then over time, where the value really comes, of course, is putting those models into production. And these programs contribute, uh, by Humana's account, more than $400 million annually in benefits like higher member retention, lower fraudulent and wasteful spending, and improved patient outcomes like reduced readmissions. Uh, so big shout out to that team at Humana as well. OK, so the theme uh, for my remarks here, and really for the entire session, is around collaboration, data and AI collaboration on the lake house. So you know, we'll start with some, some stats here. Um, and only the cis speak in absolute if there's any Star Wars fans in the audience. But I'm willing to wager pretty good money that every single organization in this room participates in some form of external data sharing. In our industry, that could come in a number of ways. That could come in the context of collaborative research. It could come in the context of required uh, regulatory reporting. It could be with a care delivery partner. And we see some of the advantages here uh, that sort of cover different industries that we represent. Uh, there was some research published in the American Journal of Managed Care last December that pointed to the benefits of data sharing between health plans, hospitals, and providers in terms of care coordination, in terms of lowering costs, managing population health, and really addressing some challenges around health equity. And what we're seeing now is many uh, insurers and health plans create incentives that actually encourage uh, information sharing as part of quality programs and reward structures. On the life sciences side, and there's lots of similar research, uh, Deloitte uh, recently sponsored research showing that data sharing in the context of drug development reduces that timeline by two years, uh, which equates to $260 million per drug, depending, of course, on the benchmarks you're using. And Gartner recently did some research in the context of digital health businesses and found that those businesses that embrace data sharing 
saw a three times uh, return in terms of economic benefit. But of course, it's not that easy. So what makes collaboration difficult? Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this throughout the session today and certainly on the panel. And we know that in healthcare, in particular, we're faced with data silos that leave us with a fragmented view of the patient. We have many existing uh, data systems and technologies that are proprietary, which tend to lock providers and consumers into a single platform. We, of course, have additional constraints due to the highly sensitive nature of patient data and all the associated privacy concerns that we need to uh, take into consideration. And of course, we not only need to limit ourselves to data, we also need to think about collaboration in the context of analytics and AI, because data really is the foundation, it is the beginning. So as you've heard all week at Summit, if you've been in any session, uh, the Lake House is the perfect solution for this. It's built for collaboration. It supports all your data with open source and open standards. It delivers unified governance across all personas and tooling. And it delivers uh, you know, the ability, of course, to collaborate with data sharing technology that we'll talk about. So what I want to do uh, for the next 10 minutes here is talk specifically about how we further have invested in collaboration through important partnerships in healthcare and life sciences. So I'll do this through a, a few ways. One is a technology partnership that's focused on healthcare data ingestion. Another is our marketplace for data sharing, which as of yesterday is now in, uh, has, has gone GA, so we're very excited about that. Uh, we'll take a look at the future of model sharing, and then we'll also do a preview of clean rooms, which are in private preview. So let's start with healthcare data ingestion, because every conversation that we have uh, with a health system or an insurer always starts with some frustration about receiving data from partners, extracting data from source systems. Uh, we often hear that EPIC is a four-letter word. So ingesting and integrating source data in healthcare, this remains a huge challenge, despite standards like HL7 and FHIR, partly because there are so many standards and so many file formats across these different data modalities that we need to deal with. Organizations also need to manage a variety of authentication methods and communication methods with these source systems and deal with challenges around data updates. Additionally, the data, of course, must be curated for analytics, so you need some sort of ontology, you need mapping processes, you need code set normalization, not to mention natural language processing pipelines for clinical documentation. This is costly and time consuming to build in-house. We know many organizations that want to accelerate onboarding of advanced analytics and they're sort of stuck on how do we bring data out of source systems into Databricks. It requires engineering resources that you would need to build the, build the pipelines in the first place and then of course maintain them over time. So enter Redox. Redox is one of our newest technology partners and they've been at it for a long time, including with some of you here in this room. EHR integration is their bread and butter. They can connect to well over 90 of them, not to mention uh, connecting to public health agencies, to care quality, to digital health products, to HIEs. Redox has completed well over 5,000 integrations in healthcare, so they have experience with many, if not all, of the source systems that your organization is dealing with. So what this means in the context of Databricks customers is that Redox can serve as a single point of connection into the lake house for dozens of different source systems in your organization. They can manage the historical backloads, they can manage the real-time integration to fuel these use cases without accumulating tech debt of building out these custom pipelines on your own, and it can get you into production much faster. So these pipelines can support everything, and we have great examples of how this has supported use cases ranging from operational reporting to omni-channel marketing to clinical risk prediction. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, you know, please reach out to us or Redox to learn more. So data marketplace. Data marketplace uh, is a personal uh, sort of passion project of mine within Databricks. My background uh, prior to joining Databricks was leading the real world data business at Optum. Uh, so very plugged into aggregating data, using data for research, and thinking through some of the dynamics of data exchange and data sharing. So we're thrilled that Data Marketplace has gone uh, GA, as I mentioned. I think last year at Summit, we just were in private preview. We went in, uh, we went in public preview 
uh, most recently in April. So with Data Marketplace, think of this as a white pages sort of directory to discover data assets. Uh, and not only data, but also other products like notebooks uh, that you can use alongside of the data. So there are other data sharing uh, sort of marketplaces technologies. What makes our marketplace a bit unique really is that you can share more than just data. You can share notebooks that will accelerate time to insight. So what are the benefits for data consumers? And by consumers, I mean organizations that work with secondary data assets, uh, which we know is probably every single organization in this room. Well, one, it's easier to discover data through marketplace listings. It's easier to then access the data from a technology perspective via delta sharing. And it delivers faster time to insight because of these notebooks that I mentioned that providers are making available on marketplace. And I want to give you a sense uh, specifically of some of these wonderful data providers that are now part of our marketplace that, again, is generally available. These are assets relevant to you in healthcare and life sciences. So you'll hear more uh, about Jon Snow Labs and Datavant later in my presentation today. You also get to hear directly from IQVIA and Antata on the panel uh, in a little bit. So some of the other organizations I want to call out, Trinetics, which offers curated electronic health record data used for real-world evidence. Definitive Healthcare, which offers data around prescription activity, as well as the Atlas Reference and Affiliations data set. So this includes granular information on healthcare professionals and organizations. So if you're looking to understand things like referral patterns. Kythera which transforms raw medical and pharmacy claim data into patient journey and encounter-based assets, ranging from uh, specialty areas like oncology to chronic conditions and chronic disease management. Ribbon Health, which provides access to comprehensive provider information, including location directories. And I'm going to scroll because I'm going to lose my note here. And I don't want to miss anyone. Veritas, uh, so Veritas has a, a comprehensive index of US mortality data. So this is from 2010 to present. If you're engaged in any sort of observational research, this is a very important outcome to understand and to study. Uh, so we're very happy to have Veritas on the marketplace. And LendRx is another. They provide dynamic com company and sentiment information on, uh, on drugs. So if you're on a pharma brand team, that may be of interest to understand sort of external market perception uh, in terms of your brand. There are also on top of this are organizations more horizontally focused, but providing assets in healthcare and life sciences like REARC. So REARC makes available demographic and behavioral data that can be better used to understand things like social determinants of health. Um, so expect this list to grow by the month. If you're on the data provider side and you're interested, reach out to us. We'd love to expand uh, the program uh, and include you as well. Uh, so a bit of a preview. So Bill Zanim will be joining us on panel later. Uh, IQVIA, and there are a number of IQVIA folks in the room if you'd like to connect with them. They're a leading provider of data solutions, analytics, and technology. They have more than 100 billion healthcare records processed annually, 100 billion. So absolutely massive global reach. Available IQVIA assets include their HCP and product reference data, as well as sales and prescription data and longitudinal patient data. So we're thrilled that they're a launch partner uh, with us on Marketplace. I also want to offer a bit of a preview for Juan May Oh from Antada, who will be joining us on panel as well. So Antada is a division of McKesson, and we have a number of McKesson folks in the room that offer very deep data specific to oncology. So they support more than 80 different cancer subtypes uh, and have millions of patient records for this very deep longitudinal patient research. As you heard earlier, uh, they also were a finalist in the Data for Good Award for the incredible work they're doing to support oncology research. Uh, so very excited about data sharing and marketplace. The future for marketplace, and there were some previews and hints at this throughout the week, is around model sharing. So how do we go from a marketplace of, of data sharing and sharing notebooks for exploration to actually being able to serve uh, models, including large language models. Uh, and you've heard this throughout the week. Lakehouse is the ideal platform for generative AI development and deployment. We want to build the ecosystem 
uh, for organizations to be able to deploy models that they build on Databricks as well, because fundamentally we believe organizations are gonna embrace this best of breed approach to models that includes building on top of open source models and libraries, not just models relying on proprietary APIs. So we've built some of our own solutions uh, using Dolly and Langchain. Uh, this is one example around biomedical information retrieval. There's a huge corpus, as you know, if you're on the uh, sort of R&D side of life sciences of published medical literature that expands really by the day. Um, so LLMs are a terrific way to support summarization and question and answering of these data assets. And we can do a demo for you down at the expo uh, if you're interested. We're also working with partners like John Snow Labs, uh, also here in the room, I think in the, in the corner over there. Um, they're building state-of-the-art LLMs based on open source models. So this is an example of summarization from clinical notes. It's taking a very complex procedure note that you probably can't read, uh, which is part of the point, full of medical jargon and abbreviations, and it's summarizing that procedure in a more easily digestible form. So this has the potential to both reduce clinician burnout uh, in terms of care uh, transitions, uh, really improve uh, continuity of care for the patient, and it can support specific use cases like prior authorizations. So I think as we think about some of the use cases for LLMs in healthcare, probably won't be diagnosing patients today, but starting with something like clinical note summarization is a really great way uh, to start to work with uh, you know, these technologies uh, and really improve information sharing across your organization. Um, so John Snow Labs, we work with them quite a bit. We have a number of solutions we've built uh, on more traditional natural language processing pipelines. They're the leader in NLP and AI for healthcare, and the state-of-the-art uh, large language models that they're building specifically for the medical domain uh, you know, really have uh, just over the last few months taken off and have a lot of key applications around things like clinical entity recognition as well as extracting diagnosis codes. Uh, and Johnson Labs will be a launch partner as we expand uh, marketplace to support model sharing uh, in the future. So one more for me, one more exciting announcement, and that is around Clean Rooms. So Clean Rooms is a uh, brand new offering uh, for Databricks. It's in a limited private preview now, uh, but we have engineering teams that are doing a lot of development on it. Um, and what, what are clean rooms? So they fundamentally, they take advantage of delta sharing capabilities to enable multiple collaborators to share data into a secure neutral environment where only the authorized users can then access and analyze the data. What makes this unique in the context of Databricks? Well, due to delta sharing, the data exchange is frictionless. It doesn't require data replication. The solution can scale to multiple collaborators, so it's not just limited to having two collaborators in a clean room solution. It can accommodate all programming languages supported by Databricks. We see some other solutions emerging on the market that are only SQL-based solutions. And uh, perhaps most importantly, there's built-in workflow functionality that makes it easy for collaborators to review and approve code and analytics, which protects sensitive information. Um, so this is big applications we see on uh, research context is big applications if there are collaborators who are concerned about uh, sort of giving a partner access to their full data, yet there are certain analytics that they can uh, ordain within this clean room environment. And we're very excited to partner with Datavant, and they're here uh, in the front table here, uh, to bring the clean room solution to healthcare and life sciences. So Datavant's mission is to connect the world's health data for better patient outcomes. And I know many organizations in this room already take advantage of Datavant's technology. They're well on their way to doing this uh, as a trusted partner to healthcare and life sciences organizations. And what they've done is they've assembled the largest healthcare data network in the world using its tokenization technology. So this offers a secure method to link data on direct identifiers. Uh, meaning if you have two different organizations that want to link data, they don't want to exchange PII, they each can run the tokenization engine on their respective side of the firewall. It creates uh, a secure link for them to bring that data together. Uh, and their network using this technology includes thousands of hospitals, hundreds of health plans, uh, as well as hundreds of real-world data organizations. 
And what they're now doing uh, in the context of Databricks is building native tokenization capabilities on Databricks. So that will launch in August. Uh, looking a little further ahead, when Databricks moves into public preview for clean rooms, and we're targeting that in the September timeframe, we'll bring this capability into clean rooms by enabling on-the-fly tokenization and encryption keys that can support secure analytics across multiple collaborators in this clean room environment. Uh, we're also in the early stages of thinking through a services workflow around de-identification. So Datavan owns Privacy Hub, uh, which is the largest uh, service provider of expert determination uh, de-identification services in the United States. And given the controls in place with clean rooms, for example, you could restrict uh, collaborators from, from you know, uh, viewing record level data uh, we aim to offer a solution whereby the outputs of the analytics could be certified rather than necessarily needing to certify the underlying data itself because we have this new technology-enabled approach uh, to putting appropriate controls and guardrails in place with clean rooms. So very excited for this to come. So ultimately, our vision uh, is that when healthcare data is securely connected, and we're able to integrate the data with the analytics, we have the power to do incredible things. We have the power to detect rare disease. We have the power to deliver personalized care to patients and the power to discover new medicines. Uh, so very exciting to see the technology come together uh, for the vision that many people have had and been talking about for quite some time. Uh, and we'll hit on some of these uh, in the panel as well. But with that, I'd like to turn it over to Greg Nelson, the VP of Data Operations at Highmark Health to share their living health strategy and what it means for data collaboration. Thank you. They turned it on too soon. Wow, that was painful. Let's see if we can get the slides moved over. Okay, good afternoon everyone. This is the interactive part of the conversation. <laughs> all right, you all ate lunch. You all sat through Mike's talk for 20 minutes. Take your fingers, roll them in the air. Let's get some blood flowing. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, as Mike said, this is a really exciting time to be in healthcare. I'm super excited about the technology and the collaborations, meeting new friends, new friends, Danielle, uh, as well as seeing people that I've known for 30 years. Uh, it's super, super exciting to be here. My uh, goal today is to talk to you a little bit about Highmark Health and our living health strategy. The reason this topic becomes important for me is that I'm one of those crazy people, even at my young age, that I think we can fix healthcare. I'm excited about being able to fix healthcare. I was having a conversation with my wife the other day and. There may have been wine involved, and she says, you really think you can fix healthcare, don't you? <laughs> and like, she was surprised. I was like, okay, you don't know me very well. Um, I, and, and the reality is, for those who have been in the industry for a long time, know that we are, the technology has certainly changed. Um, the problems are often the same that, we, that we've seen 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It takes a lot of work to go from idea to bringing in data, to integrating data, to managing and enriching and augmenting data, and for what purpose? We're exhausted by the time we get to the point of actually wanting to use that data, the use cases. My hope is really before I retire, my impact at my organization is that we can do this with fewer hands, fewer eyeballs, fewer fingers on the keyboard, so we can take that and transform that workforce into impact. So that's what I truly believe, and I, th I think we have an opportunity to do that. So I was in Intermountain Healthcare before. Um, I came to Highmark about eight months ago. And one of the things that was fascinating to me about Highmark is, for those in the health and life sciences industry, you know what a pay provider is. It's a payer and a provider. So that's essentially what Highmark Health is. What was different about that is they didn't treat them as different P&Ls. They didn't treat them as different organizations. It was person-centered. That becomes really important when we talk about how we deliver experiences to this model. So our mission is about creating remarkable health experience. 
So in a blended health organization like Highmark, we have members. Those are people who go through employers or uh, open marketplace or Medicaid for the government and buy insurance. And anybody who's dealt with an insurance company knows that that's just a wonderful experience. That's up there with AT&T. Sorry, nobody from AT&T is here, right? But nobody wants to talk to their health insurance company. They want to have that frictionless. They want to understand, how do I find care? How will I know it's actually going to get paid? So before I go, that the whole price transparency stuff is about, how do I make sure that I can reduce that, that uncertainty, that friction that exists? So if we really believe this, and we think about this as an opportunity, um, that's where I think a scale of a high mark or an Optum or a Humana can really start to change the nature of the, of the, of the world that we live in. So I believe that, so Highmark at a, at a high level, 42,000 employees, about 29 million lives under contract, which means mostly we're an insurance company. But about 10 years ago, we acquired Allegheny Health Network, which is a provider system, about 10 to 12 hospitals. Um, and it really started to change the culture internally for, wait, these are not just members, these are actually people receiving care. I can't just deny a claim and, and then not have to deal with the outcomes. And that's what I think is pretty exciting about this. One thing that's important to note is Highmark is a pretty complicated organization. We have, uh, I work for Highmark Health, which is the big uh, circle. Uh, as part of that, we have a, a, set of, a number of diversified portfolio companies, including a stop loss company, a dental, uh, dental company. Um, we have a technology arm uh, that delivers platforms to, to different uh, Blue Cross customers across the, across the nation. Of course, uh, our own health plan and the list goes on. So it's a very complex data state. My role at Highmark is uh, I, I essentially care for our data. Any data that comes in and out of the organization goes through our platforms. So I have responsibility for both on-prem and cloud, which really presents some unique challenges, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those challenges. Before I do that, I want to personalize our work a little bit more. I want to introduce you to Felicia. Felicia is 34 years old. She was a real patient, fictitious name, and I protected all the PHI and everything else. Um, but replace this story with your own stories that I know that each of you have about where the healthcare system has failed you. Whether it's me personally wanting a dermatology consult and saying, oh great, we can fit you in in May of 2024. My next appointment is not going to be for another year. That's broken. That's broken. That's a broken healthcare system. So in case of, of Felicia, she went to the urgent care. She had, she had something that she was concerned about dermatologically. Um, physicians saw them, uh, were not very well connected. Uh, they, they printed out uh, the referral because you had to have a referral in order to get paid. Uh, the paper got lost. The referral never happened. And it turned out that she, she indeed had... Um, metastatic, uh, metastatic melanoma. So the delay in care impacts real people, right? So how do we change that dynamic? So when I think of her journey, there are literally hundreds of thousands and millions of patient journeys that we all go through every single day. Felicia's just one. And by the way, this was something in Felicia's life that happened at a period in time, whereas 10 years later, it might be something different. It's always gonna be something different with healthcare. The inevitability of the human condition is that we're always going to need care. And so if you think about this as a journey map, there are so many opportunities to have fixed that. Well, most of us are technologists, and I'm, I'm actually a well-trained husband as well, which, which means it only took me 15 years to recognize that when my wife presents a problem to me, she doesn't want it fixed. <laughs> so as technologists, we see this problem of Felicia, and we're saying, well, let's fix it. Let's solution it. But we really need to understand what is the actually good look like? What is the actual conditions under which this has to happen? So if we look at happiness and sad, I'm, I'm happy that somebody listen to me. They diagnosed my condition and they referred me to somebody. But all of a sudden we get into these doubt modes where we say, well, is this going to be covered by insurance? 
or which specialist should I see, or how long is it going to take for me to get in, and will it get paid, and, and how quickly could this happen? Because this is devastating to people. We know as people in data science and AI and data that there are lots of potential solutions in the marketplace to actually address these, right? Patients like me, automated uh, specialty referral finder based on the fact that you know what insurance I have, you ought to be able to connect me before I ever leave that place. How often have we been in, in a healthcare environment and somebody says, well, you gotta do X, Y, or Z next, but they don't make it easy. I give kudos to organizations like CVS who just make this stuff easy. I had a birthday, I got a text that says, hey, you know, you're at an age right now where you could use some care. Would you like to go ahead and schedule this? Whether it's a vaccine, vaccine or a colonoscopy, they make it easy. That next best action at scale to account for the lifestyle, the history, uh, really is an important element of what we can bring to the table. This is our voice. This is what we can bring to the table. So living health is really about a proactive nature of how we deliver experiences and, and treat people like people, like humans, as opposed to a member ID or a patient ID. This is about changing how we deliver healthcare. And so to me, it's, it, it's really about being predictive and comprehensive, uh, real time, and, and really it's about the outcomes that people can achieve. No matter the choice of device or modality, how many of you are involved in your organizations with CPCM programs, consent preference and contact management? Okay, healthcare is doing a pretty poor job at that, aren't we? Marketing has got it right. I mean, they're, at least they're getting better at it, right? How we actually take preferences of a customer and design experiences that take those into account. So if I wanna be called, I can opt in. If I wanna receive my EOBs as HTML, I can do that. I can make, express preferences. So part of what we're trying to do is actually design the substrate of our ecosystem around how do people actually want to hear from us? How do they want to engage with us? So I work for the Office of the, Enterprise, of the Chief Data Officer, our Enterprise Data Office. Um, this is probably not dissimilar to many organizations and how they architect. Um, the technology we use, uh, obviously Databricks on GCP. Um, when we think about the use cases, the bulk of the work, I won't tell you how many, but we have literally hundreds of people that all get us to endpoint use cases. And then the analytic team picks that up and takes it the last mile. But wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to spend so much time engineering and matching and merging and integrating? I was discussing with my friends at Redox the biggest challenge we have in front of me today, I've got to integrate 36 different new vendors in six weeks. How do I do that at scale? I can't have fingers on a keyboard. That's just not gonna be helpful. So I've gotta figure out how do I automate at scale? How do I integrate at scale? Where the eyeballs and the fingers are really focused on um, the, the quality of that data, the provenance and ensuring security and, and confidentiality. So as we think about the focus of our work, it's about acquiring, uh, organizing, managing, protecting, and then delivering. And I, my proposition is how do we do that at scale and how do we do it faster? So just a few numbers of, of about, and this is probably not dissimilar to many organizations, um, unless you're a startup. And startups always come to me and said, hey, Greg, we can solve your data problems. I'm like, really? How long have you been thinking about this one? Because we've been thinking about it a long time, and it's hard. I mean, as one famous politician once said, who knew healthcare was hard? Sorry, that was a joke. Um, so organizationally, we deliver about 80,000 extracts a year. So you talked about data sharing, Mike. Um, that's what we do, data coming in and going out of the organization at scale. Um, and so we just stood up our HDE, which is Google's health data engine. Um, and in a matter of two months, we have over, that's wrong, it says 221 million fire resources. We have over two billion. That's amazing, the, the volume of data coming in. We do about five billion EDI exchanges every single day. So being able to do a lot of what we talk about at scale is really challenging. So we knew that part of our journey to get to living health 
I, I was at Highmark for maybe a month, and I have an opportunity to, to sit in an a executive meeting talking about where we're headed with our enterprise data platform. And one of the comments was from the most important person in the room, and she said, I refuse to let data set the pace for our strategy. Man, that keeps me up every night. So how do you do this? How do you do, how do, you do this at scale? So we gotta, fig we gotta think differently. We gotta think about competencies and skills. We gotta think about partnerships and we gotta think about design patterns that allow us to do this at a very, very different scale than we've had to before. So part of our data strategy, we went live in April, uh, April 19th, the day that she'll go down in infamy. infamy. Um, we went live on GCP and part of the reason was really three business case elements here. One is the technical complexity of, we had to reduce our technical complexity. I'll show a little bit of, about some of that. Um, we have a long history of legacy of technical complexity in our organization. Mainframe, COBOL, DB2, and we have, I, I think we really love vendors. So if there are any vendors in the room, come on over because we collect them. So that was one of the problems. I gotta reduce the technical complexity because I can manage it uh, in, a, in a much better way. Um, simplifying the data ecosystem, the Senke diagram, no relationship to Mike, in the middle was actually part of an assessment that we did where we said, what are, my, what, what are all my to and from data sources? That told a story. That told a story of how much and how brittle our environment was because of the complexity of those data touch points. And everybody wants to hear about how we're gonna lower costs. Because moving to the cloud will absolutely lower your costs. He said every sales rep that was trying to sell cloud technology. So we knew that in order to reduce the cost, we actually had to prove it. And so we, we actually set ourselves up with a couple of bets. So part of our initial platform build for Google was we were very intentional about what bets we wanted to make. And the first bet that we wanted to make was around our common ingestion framework. And we were really trying to address the question of how might we um, reduce the complexity in time and the skill set that it takes to onboard new data. That was a bet we were willing to make. We did a benchmark and it took about 145 hours to take one table from on-prem into the data warehouse. One table. My challenge was 10,000 tables. So do the math, and that's about 450 person years of effort. So if I went to my boss and I said, hey, can I hire 450 people to just do data onboarding? What kind of response do you think we'd get, especially in this climate with healthcare, right? So we knew, we, knew we, we had to make a bet. And if I could change the cost curve on that, that's really what we're trying to attack. Now we got it down to about 40 hours, for one table, still got a long way to go. I'm gonna reduce that to minutes. Crazy, now all the data engineers are the problem, but you don't understand, it's complicated. I gotta do source to target mappings, I gotta ensure referential keys are intact, and I gotta do this, and I gotta do this. But that's our challenge. And if we get it in hours, and I fail to get it in minutes, I'm okay with that. Just don't tell my team. So we think about all the bets we've made on the platform, the common digestion framework was just one of those. So as we look at this pipeline of components about how do we actually go from left to right, classic data warehousing, Inman, Kimball, Imhoff sort of modeling, guess who built our new platform? People who grew up in that same mindset. So I wanna think about this in a fundamentally different way. And there's no way we're gonna do it if we continue to use the thinking that got us here to get us to the next level. And that's gonna be our fundamental challenge. So it's good, it got me down to 45 hours, but I really wanna take this and automate the entire pipeline. And what's gonna be really important with the volume and velocity of data that we're now seeing is how do I do this with complete observability? I gotta have data quality, that can't go down. I've gotta do it fast, so we talked about the speed, and I have to know what's going to likely go wrong General Electric, one of my clients, when I was in consulting, we did some predictive maintenance for aircraft engines. And they wanted models before AI got really fun and popular. They wanted to say, look, I need to predict 
whether it was Shell Oil Company, when a drill bit was gonna break before it broke, because it was really expensive to pull the rig out of the thing if, if it's broken, but it's really cheap comparatively if I can pull it out of the ground. So using those same mindsets, how do I predict when pipelines are gonna fail? So I was super excited to hear when Databricks announced the monitoring and observability work and more to come on that, I guess, this year, but hopefully, you, 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 Carolyn, you said it was gonna be done by the end of the month. <laughs> but it's these things that help us grow at scale, which I'm, I, I just have to say, it's a wonderful time to be in health IT, in data, in analytics, in AI, because this, this is the model of yesteryear. We've gotta really change the dynamics of this, of this model. So the ingestion patterns that we focused on for Go Live back in April were really four. I, I wanted to be able to do change data capture on databases. We have a lot of legacy databases, Oracle, DB2, Teradata, and I needed to be able to replicate those tables and know when either the schema changed or the actual underlying data and then stream that into a Kafka topic. So that was one pattern we needed to support. The second was we receive a lot of files so being able to import JSON and XML and CSVs, all of these things at scale without having to have manual intervention with a second database batch ingestion. A lot of vendors want to say, hey, we'll do, we'll do a dump of our star schema. Can you, can you ingest that? So that was the third one. And the last one is we actually wanted to be able to modernize um, to ingest on APIs. Because that's where I think the vendor partner ecosystem is really going to be fundamentally changing the, the game on this. So we went live with those things, and, that, and that, was, that was really important work. So the proposition today, you, you kind of see the option one, option two. Option one was do nothing, continue the trajectory that we were on before. And option two is let's build something that will actually get us there. So that's where we're at today. So option two, we built, we went live with it. We're, we're doing a pretty good job, but we can do better. So being able to change the cost curve on the resource stuff. So I'm sure that I'm not gonna go through these bullet points, but I'm sure these resonate with a lot of organizations about what current state looks like and future state looks like. We've gotta be able to deliver data at scale. We've gotta be able to understand the provenance of data, the quality of data. We've gotta deliver it in formats that people understand and want to use. And we've gotta spend more time on actually use cases rather than playing with data. So the impact, um, for me, there's lots of economic impacts. There's, there's good things that are happening in the organization. You know, this is all good stuff, right? For me, it goes back to what our COO said in that meeting. I wanna outpace our strategy. I wanna be ahead of the strategy so that when I deliver, when they wanna try something new, I wanna be able to support tens of thousands of experiments in the business and not be the rate limiter. Because right now, I feel like I'm an order taker. That's gotta change. So going back to Felicia, if somebody says, hey, I wanna in, in, inject this next best action into Epic Player, Player Platform as an experience for the provider, I wanna be able to do that scale. Say, oh, yeah, we got the data, what's the endpoint? And we're essentially configuring data connectors rather than building them each time. So I'm excited to, um, it's a great time to be in healthcare, as I, as I said. I'm super excited about this conversation because it's the people in this room that are gonna change healthcare. So I would encourage you to reach out to me uh, and connect. I'm happy to connect, happy to have conversations. Um, and I was joking about vendors, please don't contact me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we don't need it. Okay. Or you can go to the next one if you want. Okay. Everyone mic'd up? Got it. Hello? Hopefully. Yeah. All right. It's like the exit row test. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's start with Nick, because we, everyone knows Greg at this point. 
Uh, and we certainly made reference to Bill from IQVIA and Juan May from Ontada. Uh, so Nick Woodbridge is from GSK. I think GSK is a household name. They're a global biopharma manufacturer. Consistently rank in the top 10 uh, in sales. And they have a really unique portfolio because it is so broad. It's oncology, it's vaccines, it's specialty areas, it's respiratory conditions. So one of the things that Nick has to think about uh, a lot in his role is how does he make data available and also models available across different geographies and different markets uh, as you know, you're building things out in commercial. So I'd love for you to just spend a few minutes because I know I've talked to various folks in commercial pharma in the US may build a great model. How do they make that actionable uh, in other markets and share that? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, so, so from an, kind of an enablement perspective, I mean, how, how we're thinking about this is we, we want to connect, you know, our data providers, so, so our QVIAs, our, um, you know, specialty uh, data providers, and we want to connect those in through the, the, the kind of central function, the central organization, um, and, then, and then we want to expose those out to the individual markets because, you know, if, if you are in an emerging market, you know, you, you, you don't have maybe some of the needs around digital customer journeys, uh, next best uh, experiences, um, you know, some of the more advanced, you know, capabilities, um, you're, you know, you're still kind of in a, you know, one-to-one -one, uh, rep to HCP, um, you know, provider kind of, kind of example. So, so what we've had to do in the past and kind of why we're really excited about uh, the, the data exchanges that are coming on is, is, you know, build out all those automated solutions, right? Um, you know, build out the automated data ingestion frameworks, uh, build out, you know, uh, advanced, you know, security models that, you know, allocate data to, you know, one region but hide the data from another region, you know, expose all of that. And we had to make those investments, you know, inside in order to drive the, the business forward. And, and, and I think just like everybody else here in the room, you know, now, now the pace of innovation is, is just accelerating, right? Um, uh, you know, we're, we're you know, obviously getting ready for a major RSV launch, and, you know, our U.S. business is coming to us. Well, you know, hey, we want to onboard, you know, 20 new data sources that we've, we've never seen, you know, from a data platform perspective. So, so they're always looking for that edge, you know, as part of their go-to-market strategy. And, and, and having to manage and maintain these kind of legacy pipelines, you know, from an ingestion and data onboarding perspective, and then from our side, also then having to map it into this kind of complex data state, um, you know, it, take, it takes IT toll, right? I mean, there, there's no way of getting around it. I mean, even if you build the world's best mousetrap for data ingestion pipelines, you're going to have, you know, a, a, a developer make an errant commitment and your data pipeline's going to go down. Uh, you know, you, your, your cloud infrastructure is going to have issues for those who are on Azure, uh, you know, a few, few months ago. Um, you know, all of these kind of things are going to impact your, your, your ability to make data available. Um, and, so, and so we see this data exchange really enabling the future vision where we can connect our, our data providers, our producers of data with, with the data consumers and do it in a, in a world where we don't have to make these kind of core IT investments. Once those resources then get freed up, then we're talking about model enablement, model development, model sharing, um, so we can move really higher up the analytic stack and not be focused on undifferentiated, uh, you know, just kind of like file moving, EDI based kind of activities. And, and now we're really driving insight and we're enabling the business to kind of meet their, their sales goals and needs. That's great. So what do you look for when you source data? You have two data organizations here. Like tell, give us some of your secrets. What, uh, what do you look for in, in data partners that are gonna be delivering you data? Yeah, absolutely. Great, great question on that side too. So, so I, I mean, so what we're starting to think about our, our data is as, as a data supply chain, right? So, so if we think about this almost from a manufacturing term, um, you know, we have our kind of parts manufactured, right? The people that are providing the wheels and the bolts and the, you know, uh, individual components and elements that really drive and, and help us build the, the car that we, you know, then go on our journey. And, and through that supply chain mechanism, um, you know, we want trusted partners, right? So we want people that are, that are obsessed about data quality, data availability. We want them to start to think about, you know, coming up the stack, right? You know, again, why should, you know, GSK manage the data availability when we could leverage our partners to provide managed services to make those, those, those components available to us? And, and, and this is stuff that, you know, you couldn't do, you know, five, five ten years ago if you were on-premise. You, you, you struggled with even, even kind of pre-data pre exchange. 
but, but what we're seeing through some of our kind of initial proof of concepts and like developing the business cases around it is that, is that our suppliers can actually step up the stack, enable it through managed services, and really take the ownership of, of the life cycle. And so, and so instead of having you know, our sales teams, our marketing teams, come to IT, then us opening up a support ticket with our data providers, hey, why didn't this file drop in this folder? Why didn't this email come with this file? You know, instead, our suppliers are, are shoulder to shoulder with us, supporting the tickets, you know, addressing the physical needs, and actually enabling that, that next mm -hmm. step in the, in the data journey. So, so we see data, data partnerships as being probably the next big wave mm -hmm. in innovation. Um, from, a, from an end state delivery end yeah. state marketing. Yeah, and I love your framing. If you can accelerate the sort of foundational data estate, then you can move up the stack in terms of the value chain and delivering yeah. analytics. Um, so, Bill, I want to give you sort of the inverse question. Mm -hmm. uh, so Nick just shared, you know, what a leading pharma company looks for and wants from data providers. You have a landscape, you know, you work with probably more than 100 pharma companies. What are they looking for? What do they need now? And how has IQVIA sort of adjusted uh, its business around it? Yeah, I think you know, both Greg and Nick, they, you, know, you told a historical perspective. What was the current state like or what was the prior state like? And I left pharma for about 10 years. So I was in pharma. I did, I've been doing data management for 30 years. But I left pharma for 10 years. And I came back about five years ago. I wanted to quit after my first client call. <laughs> I was like, nothing's gotten better. It used to take 450 hours to source a table, and now took 550 hours to source a table. Everybody was satisfied with the status quo. And when you put an order of magnitude, you were showing your, you know, your billions of records, your hundreds of tables. My company is a business. It's not unusual to send 20,000 data files to a customer per year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, today I process over. Last year, over four and a half petabytes of data you know, for our customers. And the industry was built that we're going to give you a file, and then you're going to pick that file up, and you're going to figure out what to do with it. You're going to QA, QC it. Whether you're a data lake or a data warehouse, you're going to go to raw, cleanse, integration, publish, doing analytics. And we knew there had to be a better way, but five years ago, the technologies didn't exist. You, know, you, got, you had to commit everything to somebody's platform. You couldn't be on-prem. You had to be in the cloud. Once you were in the cloud, everybody had their own instance. Nothing happened. And this, this idea of data sharing happened. And it's, I'd say it's taken about like three years for data sharing really get to the point where it is today. And that but first when people did data sharing, they're like, I don't have to FTP a file anymore. OK, I want to give you 20,000 tables instead of 20,000 files, what, what is, you know, okay, I just went from 500 hours to 50 hours, maybe. What we've looked at is, with the idea of data sharing, is those 10 steps a customer has to do. We don't want you to do those steps anymore. We're gonna bring the data together. We're gonna make sure it's the right data. We're gonna make sure it's cleansed data. If you have additional QA, QC checks, we do them for you. You don't need to do them. We build your conforming dimensions, your historical views. And now, instead of getting 20,000 files from us, you access a set of tables, a well-modeled database that now integrates with all the other data sources that you have. And you don't have to copy data. You don't have to move data. You don't have to do that. And what I'm really excited about now is with the Databricks marketplace, it's not just data anymore. Uh, we talk about notebooks, we talk about models. So I already figured out the first 10 things you do with the data. Well, guess what, I have a good idea what the next 10 things of the data you do as well. But those are analytics, those are models, those are building aggregates. And so as, as we're looking with the, with the entry of the Databricks marketplace, we say we can deliver the data with Delta sharing. We know we can do that, we've been doing that. Clients can access the data. Now the next part is we know how you use the data. Let's give us our best practices for how to do you know, a patient journey, our best practices on how to do a segmentation. And you can tailor them because it's a notebook. You can tailor them because it's a model. right? You don't have to commit to what we do. We just give you the best practice on how to execute it based upon you know, the hundreds of thousands of other deliverables we're doing. And so that, that shift that, that's occurring now is before the impediment with new technologies was, I have to rebuild my pipelines. I have to rebuild my processes. 
We're saying don't rebuild them, don't run them anymore. Use this up to this point. And it's really eliminating that barrier of it's really hard to adopt a new technology. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're working with Nick on this, you know, we're working with other customers on this, is how do we get the benefit from this? And it's really this, I use the phrase a lot, change your relationship with data. You know, customers, they pay us a lot of money for our data. They spend a lot more money trying to figure out how to manage and integrate our data. So we're like, let's reduce that part of that process, make it easier, make it simple to use our data. And then the next step is not just make it simple to integrate it, make it simple to create actionable insights from that information. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, Juan May, I'd like to kick it over to you next. Um, you know, we've gotten sort of the pharma data perspective. You have both. You're currently tasked with building out data products and solutions at Ontada. Prior to that, you were in Merck's uh, observational and real world evidence group. You also are at the Department of Veterans Affairs, so you've seen it from, uh, you know, really the largest integrated system in the U.S. You've been working on standards like the OMOP Common Data Model, like Smart on Fire Clinical Applications. So how do those experiences from Merck and from uh, the VA inform how you think about building out this product suite at Antada? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for asking these questions. I'm very passionate about data, and a lot of my friends here knows that I have database access. I'm actively querying my database to solve some questions in my mind. So coming back to the data center, right, is extremely important. Uh, right now, I'm at Ontada, which is one of the business units inside the McKesson corporate. Uh, Ontada is a data science and technology company uh, focusing on cancer care, okay? So let me take a second to talk about this English word, cancer. So according to a diction uh, dictionary, cancer is a noun. But I would argue that cancer is a verb because every single second in our body, same you, same me, that when our cells are dividing, some of them are making a mistake, right, in the DNA encoding if those cells do not get checked by the immune cell, and it keep having this magical power to keep replicating itself, they may become cancer. So that's why I keep thinking about that cancer is a verb, not necessarily a, a noun. And also given this fact, in the United States of America, uh, during a lifetime of you and me, 40% time that you will get diagnosed with cancer, and every year, there are about close to 2 million new cases reported in the US, along with uh, 600,000 people die due to cancer. So it's a very devastating, uh, severe disease, right? But there's also a silver lining associated with that is there are a lot of data that come from the cancer patients. If we can share, collaborate, right, we can help improve the patient care as well as accelerating the, the life science uh, treatment innovations as well. So, however, sharing data uh, for cancer patients is not as easy. Uh, that is because that as a patient in cancer, they are really require multiple disciplinary services to help them. Right. Some of them are like medical oncologies, focusing on the treatment, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, or other therapies, right? And then there is the radiology departments that doing the assessments of the tumor every couple months. And there's a pharmacy side of the house, as well as molecular diagnostic lab, right? With all these cutting edge targeted therapy required biomarkers associated with that. So the data standard become extremely important to make sure that all these data generated from different organizations right, can talk to each other harmoniously. So at Ontada, we heavily leverage on data standard, including the FHIR R4, as well as the USCDI uh, data standard. But neither of them is oncology specific. So during our project, we augmented with two other data standards to help improve the data quality. One is uh, the genomic reporting, which is one of the FHIR uh, sub-IG uh, implementation guide, along with MCO, which stands for Minimum uh, 
common uh, oncology data element. So based on this set of uh, standard, we actually recently just rolled out a network-wide uh, integration with two leading molecular uh, laboratory. So in real time, we receive both structure data as well as the PDF report associated with the genomic testing result and put those information right back into our electronic medical record system, fit into the clinical workflow for the provider so that they would not miss this information because those information are so timely, it needs to be so timely in order to determine the, the treatment decisions. And by the same token, using the standard, we enhance right, our data product completeness of the information, consistency because we use standard terminology, along with a contemporary, the timeliness of the information, which can help our uh, life science partner to address their use case. Yeah, and, and again, I think that speaks to the further up that value chain you can go in making the data ready for research, um, you know, the easier it will be for every organization to really have that jumping off point for analytics. Uh, so I want to turn to you, Greg, and then I want everyone to sort of just jump in there, uh, make it a little more dynamic. So the one thing you said that stuck out to me was 80,000 extracts a year, uh, and that number is probably growing. So how do you think about um, managing that from the perspective of trust with all these different partners who are receiving that data? Uh, and really, how do you instill that sort of trust and confidence in, in what you're sharing? Yeah, part of, it, part of it is automation, right? So when I think about, there are countless examples in, in the rest of the world, whether it's manufacturing plants that run on skeleton crews that before had literally hundreds of people running them, or these massive ships um, that, uh, that ship stuff from the Middle East or, the, or Asia. Um, and now they're being run by you know, five, 10 people. It, it's absolutely amazing. So the only way we're gonna get there from a data perspective is and I'm not anti-human, so I just want to make sure you all know that. Um, I, what I want to see is the humans move up the value chain and, and really focus on impact. Um, so when I think about those 80,000 files, what would have to be true for us to be hands-off and to let that operate? You know, it, it would have to be true that we had good standards, <clears throat> that we would have to understand um, the right interfaces, that, that we could talk to people, that we would be fault-tolerant and resilient, in our data processes, they would have to be true that uh, we would have to have measurement of quality and monitoring of quality continuously. Um, the velocity of data right now, there, there are oftentimes data we just never land. So how do you implement traditional data quality measurement on data that never lands? And so it's, it's really thinking about that holistically as a system uh, that's just got to, we've got to transform how we do things. Others on the topic of trust? Yeah, I mean, I completely um, agree with that from a trust perspective. I mean, so, so obviously within like sales and commercial operations, um, you know, trust is paramount. And, and oftentimes in today's world, you know, our, our stakeholders, you know, the, the, the field force, the marketeers, they're uncovering the issues, right? I mean, because, you know, we've moved past some of the kind of foundational, you know, did the file show up? You know, with, with IQV, right, you know, it's, I think it's where like 50,000 files that we're sharing, but, but you know, it's like we've moved past the kind of foundational aspects of, of the data just being transported in, from one spot to the other to actually needing to understand what's in, inside of the files and, and really understand that not only from a, you know, semantic layer, you know, yes, we've got common data models, we've got common data integration standards, but, but actually to, to know, okay, well, you know, my um, sales report yesterday, looked like this value today, it's 10x, well, you know, we probably messed something up along that supply chain. So, so we see that or as Or it was like, a great day in the field. Oh yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so we see, we see that, that as the next wave, because we've, we've, we've you know, with, with this kind of data exchange, and I think with, as an industry, we've elevated ourselves to that layer. So in that case, you know, it's really gonna be come down to the augmented, you know, solutions, right? AI, I think, is gonna be a big player in this space because you need you know, the individual in the field to empower the systems with that semantic understanding, not what happens today, which is we say, oh yeah, file pipeline worked, all right, we're done, like everybody go home, pat yourself on the back, and then you know, we've left the wrong insights out mm -hmm. there. So, 
so we, you know, it, this is going to be a huge up and coming area around trust and, and trust and the trust model. I can also uh, add some perspective of the data quality. So, um, as I mentioned, right, we are very focused on oncology care. There are many uh, several key data elements that we are actively right tr tracking. What is the completeness of the data? Like the cancer staging should be more or less complete because those are very important variable, right, for for cancer patients. And furthermore, we are also leverage AI to look into right, all the sequence of events happening at the patient, right? Leveraging the common data model and trying out all sequence of combination to see whether there are data that is not necessarily correct. Like for example, you should not have a service date after the death date, right? Things like that, but you cannot check out like manually so many table. It's very busy work to write those SQL query, right? And leveraging AI to look into the, all the combination of the sequence of events that is very helpful to surface up potential data quality issue. So a human, like Greg, you mentioned, right, is kind of like bump up in the food chain to look into those, um, those escalation of the data quality issue and then to figure out whether it's a problem or not. And maybe if it is an issue, we do need to adjust that. Mm -hmm. I was going to add, we look at the, the trust aspect from two perspectives. One is definitely, can the data be trusted? Mm -hmm. And that's where we find often, not that our data is never wrong, you know, there's data quality issues everywhere, but how many times do we spend time trying to figure out if something's right or wrong? And how do we simplify that? Mm -hmm. And tying that together with the privacy aspect of trust, um, we're looking at the concepts of the clean room are not just to treat sensitive data. Um, you know, Greg, your side of the end of your business, you know who the individual is. On my side, we're not allowed to know who the individual is. And so we've always had a very strict policy in that, well, yeah, we'll do this analysis for you and you'll give you a list of doctors or a list of somebody to contact because there's a new patient with the disease or there's a patient that's having a problem staying on their therapy, right? There's a limit to what we can do. That data's always lagged the industry by 45 days, the event by 45 days, because we're so focused on privacy and not enabling the re-identification of data. And so as you know, we look at the clean room, you know, working with Databricks, the idea is, if can we put that data out there, allow companies to bring their real-time data, your APIs, you know, the information you're getting from medical record systems, bounce that up and mingle that with our data to also get not re data that cannot be re-identified mm -hmm. out of those systems. And it's a radical change. If you take 45 days off of an event, 45 days off of the next best action and shrink it down to 24 hours, how, how, does the, how do you change your business? How do you enable that? And I think the pain there, though, is the risk of re-identification. Mm -hmm. And if you merge poor quality data, you're going to get the wrong results. But then you also, if you bring certain types of data in, you may expose that information. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're hoping, you know, and working with companies, uh, working with Databricks, is how do we solve that problem? And to get that increased value of speed, the increased value of sharing information, um, without disrupting, mm -hmm. you know, the things we can't break. Yeah, I, I love the comments on clean rooms. Like, what other use cases um, do you all have in mind for clean rooms? Anything you're thinking about? Yeah, I don't know, uh, so I don't know yet, but I was excited. We have, um, we have clients who uh, contractually were not allowed to have people offshore work on that data. They can't see it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually thinking about, can we use clean rooms to allow people to do tokenization on data where they could actually not do analytics on the data, they could actually do data engineering in a clean room. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that would be a game changer for us. We, have a goal as part of our business case for our enterprise data platform to optimize the resources between east and west. And right now we're at max because we've got to have people on shore who can do data, mm -hmm. production support and data engineering uh, for those clients. And if I, can, if I can have a solution for that, that will change the dynamics of what we can do offshore. Yeah, and for us we've got you know, a lot of use cases, but uh, the kind of the top three for us are, you know, from a pure marketing perspective, uh, you know, we, we all, from a digital enablement perspective, we've, we've seen all these walled gardens, you know, wh whether it's Facebook, whether it's GCP or, or Google or, you know, so, so those walled gardens already have the construct of a clean room. 
Um, and yet, you know, from, from a, a, a healthcare and life sciences company, we, we can't access it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the integration costs and the difficulties of getting that information make it so large that, that we don't actually do that as, as, a, um, as a key enablement activity. And, and so now we see the clean room as that, as that inroad in. So we can take on like modern marketing, you know, modern marketing principles, uh, you know, not kind of have the, 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 the spraying of advertising and make the advertisement a lot more efficient because we're targeting the right customer segments. Um, and then, and then in the, kind of in the same uh, vein of uh, you know, US medical affairs, so, so we, we have a lot of specialty um, cancer treatments. Those are obviously complex uh, uh, you know, um, care models. And, and so we um, desperately want to help with the patient outcomes um, in these kind of complex environments and to be able to identify events in the, in the um, EHR systems that, that we can then, from a meta, meta affairs perspective, target, um, you know, we're really looking forward to, to kind of injecting that. And that has to be done within the clean, cleaner construct from a, from a de-identification mm -hmm. perspective. Um, and, then, and then just on the last one, from a real world, world evidence perspective, you know, obviously commercial pharma, we are, would love to start building out our customer journeys, user journeys based on the real world um, data. Today, it's, it's too risky. You know, even, even if we separate it, it makes it, you know, it, our, our legal and risk compliance would never support mm -hmm. it. And so we, we see that, that model with, with our strategic partners in terms of building out that uh, clean room contract where we can marry the two and, yeah. and go to market more efficiently. Yeah, and, and what you're referring to, right, is where commercial, there's concerns about the commercial side of the house looking at basically outcomes uh, without having the appropriate protocols in place. Um, but if you're controlling the types of analytics, you could actually get a, a really rich view of that longitudinal patient. Yeah, so I think you, you guys already at a really good point already. <laughs> so um, I think that timeliness, definitely the clean room where I can help of timeliness access of data under the compliance guardrail. I think that is the key part that we see the benefits of the, the clean room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. So uh, one more question, sort of speed around everyone can answer to bring us home here. There's so many announcements at Summit, and I won't put you on the spot for your favorite Summit announcement unless you want to volunteer it. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of them we weren't even necessarily thinking about in any level of depth this time last year. So as you look forward to the year ahead, We'd just love to get some of your predictions in terms of what new technology is really going to have the biggest impact on your business here over the next 12 months. I can go ahead. Um, I think the most exciting uh, announcement that I heard uh, during the summit is the Lighthouse IQ. So I'm a, you probably have already figured out that I'm a data person, business analyst, nature, right? I see that it really unlock, democratize the capability and the scope that a business analyst, a researcher can do, right? Because what the, my preferred uh, language is English, right? To, to query the database instead of writing SQL. So it has been some time that when I'm hiring talents in as a business analyst as well as a data scientist, right? I have these combinations of skill set that they must have, right? Understanding the technical part of it, being able to self-sufficient to query the data, right? Whether it's SQL, Python, whatever the language is, right? Second is having the critical thinking and understand the underlying process, why the data were captured that way, mm -hmm. right? So those are the combination of talents that I, I need. But with these capability, right, having a more natural language interaction with the data, right, both structured and as well as hopefully unstructured data as well. I see that it definitely dial that the dial chores to like now that I think the, the talent is more important to have that critical thinking capability and understanding that data capture uh, processes and have that essentially alleviate a little bit more uh, about that that technical mm -hmm. capability so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so from, it's kind of a weird answer, but I'm actually excited about all the Unity catalog announcements. Mm -hmm. so, so I think from a product feature capability perspective, we had so much of our semantic data being stuck in, you know, legacy Hive databases and, you know, uh, Postgres, you know, uh, uh, Oracle instances. I mean, we, we have all of this metadata that's in all of these disparate sources. And, and, and even with the kind of current, you know, state in here, it, it's, it's really hard to unify it bring it in and then, and then turn it into action, right? So, so, you know, at the end of the day, you want to expose that to your data analysts. You want 
you know, I should be able to just pull open my pane and see all of these rich data sources, trust, you know, mm -hmm. see lineage, see, you know, all this operational data, you know, inside of that, that, that those pipelines and, and inside those data assets themselves. And, and, I, and I can see the story coming together and we, we see that as a major takeoff spot for all of these other initiatives. You know, whether it's LLMs yeah. or data exchanges or anything. So, yeah, we're, we're really yeah, excited it's about that. Not a weird answer at all. Because yeah, it, yeah. it really gets back to trust. The observability is key to, to trust, and, and all the efforts in that space are really focused on increasing and instilling confidence in the data. I was going to throw, it's really the combination of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, the, the announcements with the market, at least the new capabilities, you know, we've been playing with Delta sharing with Databricks playing. We've been using Delta sharing with Databricks for a couple of years now, you know, even early in the beta. But the, the marketplace is creating an accessibility to information that kind of like the Unity Catalog tries to help solve as well in that, you know, we're still providing so much information to our customers. Do they know how to use the data right? Unity Catalog can help with that. The marketplace can help with that. Um, helping bring in data assets together, integrating data assets. Um, the combination of those technologies, so having the marketplace, the tie into Unity Catalog, and being able to seamlessly do that. So I don't need a formal um, data cataloging project and a formal data documentation project and a formal data warehouse project and a formal this and a formal that. Um, as you're working together with your partners, you can essentially pre-populate all that information. You, you don't need to do it. You need to worry about what's unique to your business, not you know, what, mm -hmm. you know, not, you know, what I think another business does, where the data comes from. So you weren't willing to accept the next uh, answer is weird. I'm going to give you a weird one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a recovering social psychologist, and uh, that, that means I think really strangely. And I believe, <laughs> I believe that we are often driven by one of two things, incentives or identity. The trust framework could be an identity mantra, right? Is right, how do we deliver trust at scale and velocity? Um, but one of the things that I'm super excited about, and this is probably not the answer you, you want to hear, is all of the technologies, whether it's Gen IA, cataloging, um, Lake House IQ, Lake House IQ APIs, uh, clean rooms, are fundamentally going to change the culture of our data organizations. So how are we going to prepare a workforce to embrace the change and to understand the positive impact and the identity that can have for our mm -hmm. workforce? That's what's exciting to me, but also kind of scares me. Yeah, yeah, and the, that, that will certainly play out um, over time here, and I think what's, what will be remarkable about that is the pace of change is going to demand a quicker response in workforce than probably any transition we've seen before. Yeah. Um, so thank you again for being on the panel. Thank you. Uh, we, will, we will do some questions. We have time for uh, a few questions from the audience if anyone wants to jump in here. Hi, Siddharth there. How are you guys approaching the social determinants of health problem? So, um, interesting question. There was a lot of interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, partially driven by sort of this responsibility vector. But importantly, from a member or a patient experience, it becomes very important. What are the things that actually will improve outcomes if we could enable? So transportation, for example. I worked for ECU Health in North Carolina, a very rural safety net kind of system where SDOH factors played a significant role in outcomes and uh, readmissions and to the economics of the health system, it was, it was a primary driver. Um, so I think first of all, we talk about data quality. Um, the, the big elephant in the room with social determinants of health is that data is horrible. Mm -hmm. Primarily because of oftentimes stigma associated with asking people. Like, if I saw you, I could probably guess your nationality. I may feel less comfortable asking you what your nationality is, what your preferred language is, what is your sexual orientation, um, you know, non-binary. 
that becomes really challenging from a data quality perspective. And I think, again, going back to the cultural aspects of how do we, how do we enable a workforce that will actually be part of the solution and collecting and gathering accurate data, that's, that's huge for us. We did an audit back a couple of health systems ago. We did an audit of our uh, language preference data um, and it was horrible, absolutely horrible. Uh, and gender actually wasn't, wasn't a, race was horrible. Um, and you know, you could flip a coin and pick one of the, pick one of the ones and get, get an outcome. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges to actually effectively using SDOH data in next best action or un unattended um, you know, machine learning or AI opportunities. So yeah, I can also add a little bit more about the sole determinant of health data. So as what Greg mentioned, that is, or you also probably know that, right, is that is such an important factor, right, to determine the outcomes itself, the treatment outcomes itself. So in the uh, enhanced oncology model by CMS, uh, there is a part of the requirement is to uh, help collect, right, at least ask the patients uh, a number of, uh, I would say that validated instrument called a, a NCCN uh, distress thermometer, which capture a number of domains uh, related to the sole determinant of health. So I, I, at least I think is at the society level, right, we acknowledge that SDOH is so important. At least we should start to ask the patient whether they want to have this information documented, right, of course they can always opt out. And, but I think having these even bring it into the conversation using a validated instrument is, is very critical. Over here. Adam has a shirt in, yeah, here. Just a piggyback on that uh, ties to clean room question. If you take SDOH data and add it to any data set, de-identified, identified, how do you guys see that risk? Data Vant question too, right? You know, how do you see that risk playing into the usability mm -hmm. of GSK? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the data vent is, is kind of the key. So, so the ability to have, to tokenize the de-identified information, bring it together for the individual use case. I mean, that, it is, I, I, I don't see any other way. I don't know if, if we anybody have a, else feels differently. Yeah, we, we have an extra layer. Like there's, there's a tokenization aspect to it, so you can't see it. But the problem, and this is what we're actively working with the clean room technologies on, the, the problem is when you bring one data set is de-identified, and another data set, when you put them together, they're re-identifiable. And we have, you know, three-month-long processes to prevent that from happening today. How do we do that in a dynamic nature? And going back to trust, mm -hmm. let's say we come to an agreement, you can upload a data set to the clean room and use it. How do I guarantee you're not uploading different data than you told me you were going to update? Mm -hmm. And these are, lawyers don't like these types of scenarios, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, but th that's, you know, that's some of the things we're looking at is how do we maintain enough control to statistically prevent re-identification, but also give you the actual insights you could have if you had that 45 day process to do the analysis. So a few questions. Uh, hi, this is uh, Moody from uh, Scan Health Plan. Uh, so my question is more around uh, the patient experience. So I'm just curious how uh, some of your data transformation projects uh, have helped improve the patient experience, uh, you know, specifically getting uh, appointments in a timely manner or uh, seeing specialists uh, in a timely manner. Yeah, so um, being part of a provider system, I'll speak from the perspective of, of a couple of different organizations. So Intermountain, we did a lot of work on this uh, with experience management. Um, we know that there, it, it, it's not the most comfortable experience to deal with a health provider or a health insurance company. So being able to streamline that, being able to find and schedule care is probably our number one priority. Um, people are having a hard time getting, getting appointments that they want. And in fact, one of the Prescani questions, you know, to patients after an experience with the healthcare system is, were you able to get the appointment that you wanted, right? 
Um, that is a big challenge. Um, and it requires pretty significant cultural change mm -hmm. for providers being able to say, yeah, I'll publish my, my schedule. Um, if you've ever done any work in OR optimization, um, the number one problem there is that, you know, surgeons don't want to publish their schedule and they want to block time, you know, that they're not going to use. So it's that fundamental human behavior change, so it always comes back to social psychology, I think. <laughs> so I can also add a little bit more here, too, is that besides, right, the patient experience, we are also thinking about the caregiver's experience as well, right? As we know that, like, when we're taking care of the aging populations, right, that the patient may not have that uh, technical skill set, right, to navigate through this complex digital world. So when we design the Ontata Health, which is the patient portal to help, like, doing the logistic and things like that, we have that designed based on both the patient experience as well as the, the caregiver experience, right, to make it streamline the process so that the patient can get to the appointment quicker, right, with the help of the, the caregivers. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it, um, my company built an application uh, several years ago, and the, the issue is prior authorization. So a lot of specialty products require prior authorization for use, they're expensive products. And the, all the traditional routes where if you went with the, the payer, you went with the provider, you went with the pharmacy, if one of them tried to streamline that process, there was always a bottleneck somewhere in the process. And we had developed an application for the patient to give them full transparency to who in that chain was doing what mm. at what point in time. And the incredible thing was that the, for the particular product we did it for, the authorization process went from two weeks to 24 hours. If you were on the app, you averaged 24 hours. If you were not on the app, you averaged two weeks or more to get your authorization. And the ability for everybody to link all their data in one place in real time, you know, with the trust of the patient to have access to that information, and it was that, it was that transparency. So, you know, getting to a doctor, being able to get access to the medications, there's things that have to change. Like we can't process files for 450 hours, right? We can't do those things. And, um, but it's just like a slightly different aspect of that. All right, I think we'll leave it there, but we will hold our uh, panelists hostage uh, for another <laughs> 10 minutes. So if you want, uh, we'll be hanging out uh, over here. Please come up, introduce yourself. We'll take additional questions, but I want to thank uh, the panelists again for all the great insights. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks, Beth.